I sobered quickly. What was I going to do with them? How could I arrive at Uaxi's farm with eight ogres in tow? My situation hadn't improved significantly. I was still alive, but not for long, and I would have to sleep eventually. Then they'd awaken and remember their true hunger. A twig snapped behind me. I turned and saw a vision. Six knights carrying ropes strode toward me, led by a tall young man. Visions didn't snap twigs, and the young man was Char. He saluted me, but his eyes were on the ogres. Uncoiling a length of rope, he knelt over Seif and began to bind his ankles. The ogres slept soundly, but they were not unconscious. As soon as he felt the cord tighten, Seif woke with a roar, which shrank to a purr when he saw Char. "'What an honor, your highness. But why do you bind an ally?' He reached down and loosened the rope. That was proper. Char shouldn't have been fettering his friend. But Char pushed Seif's hands aside and tightened the rope again. How could he be so cruel? The knights had begun to bind the other ogres, who were also stirring. Seif tried again. "'Prince, I would sacrifice my life for you, and you treat me so rudely.' Still, Char paid no attention. I watched stupidly while Seif's feet lashed out. Char reeled back, loosing his grip on the rope. Seif rose and kicked the tether away. The knights hadn't made much progress with their binding either. Everywhere they were doing battle. An ogre knelt over one fallen knight, about to sink teeth into his shoulder. The knight twisted away, gaining a few seconds, but the ogre was turning toward him. Char regained his feet and drew his sword. He and Seif faced each other warily. Char spoke to me, his voice oddly loud. "'Can you tame them again, Ella? If not, run and save yourself.' The question cleared my wits. "'Seif, niche, ogre friends,' I called Nogaris. "'Why do you wish to destroy your benefactors? They have food for you, but they cannot give it to you until you do what they want.' The ogre stopped clawing and biting and pounding and lunging and kicking and looked at me trustfully. "'Would you like to know what the food is?' I asked. "'Please,' Seif said. "'The treat they have for you is a dozen baby giants only six months old.' They all smiled beatifically. "'But these friends can't bring the feast unless you let them tie and gag you. "'When they bring out the infants, they'll remove your bindings. "'So seat yourselves and hold out your arms and legs. They will be gentle.' Only Niche remained standing, looking dazed. "'Sit!' Seif commanded. Niche sat. The tying and gagging was completed quickly. Then the ogres were bound together, treatment that they endured cheerfully. Ella, Char swept deep bow. He'd grown taller. How did you tame the ogres? His voice is too loud again. I'm skilled at tongues, and I can't hear you. Uh, oh, I forgot. He extracted something from his ears. Beeswax. That's why the ogres' magic had no effect on you. Once we sight ogres, we always put the wax in. The danger is being caught unawares. Char said that one of the knights, acting as a scout, had seen me. He reported that a band of ogres was about to eat a maiden when she talked them to sleep. How did you do it? I told them about finishing school, and they began to snore. Truly? Char stared at me, then laughed. It was delightful to make him laugh. He was always so surprised. How did you really do it? He persisted. I spoke to them in ogres, and I imitated their oily way of talking. I didn't know if I would succeed. They had already parceled me up. I knew which one was going to eat every bit of me. Seif, that one, wanted my leg. Char moved his own right leg. How did they come upon you? I told him I had run away from finishing school. They caught me when I left the elves. They ate the pony the elves gave me. I shuddered. Was finishing school so wearisome that you had to run away? He asked. Very wearisome. And see what it's done to me? I can no longer break a set of dishes by accident. Now I can balance all of them on my head and stroll through Frell without dropping a single one. I have many accomplishments. Are you proud of them? He was alarmed. I nodded solemnly. I wanted to make him laugh again. Would you like to know more? He shrugged, disliking the topic. I went on anyway. To begin with, I could teach these boorish ogres how to eat properly. I seated myself on a large rock. Observe. I plucked an imaginary napkin out of the air, shook it twice, and placed it on my lap. Very ladylike, Char said politely. 
I shake the napkin twice. That's important. Why? Mice. Char smiled. There are no mice in our court napkins. You are thinking of spiders. The prince contradicts a lady. I picked up an imaginary fork and began to saw at imaginary food. Your meat is tough. You have a low regard for our cooks. Not at all. It should be tough. Don't you know why? Tell me. It is mutton. Am I not using a mutton fork? Our manners, mistress, will believe you're an imposter if you don't recognize a mutton fork when... When I don't see one, he was laughing. It could only be a mutton fork. How so? See how my fingers are bunched together at the top of the stem. I reached up and caught Char's hand. It was square and large. I extended my index finger. My finger is the fork. You grasp it so. I arranged his fingers around mine. His grip was firm. That's the only correct way to hold a mutton fork. A trout fork is managed differently. I turned his hand over to demonstrate. Angry red welts ran across his palm. The rope burned you. He pulled his hand away. It's nothing. One of the knights is a healer. What else did your manners mistress teach you? I wanted to examine the burn more closely, but I continued. Manners mistress knew your father's opinion about everything. She said he would exile any subject who ate blanc mange from a soup bowl. As a result of her instruction, I can never make such a mistake. Does my father have a special spoon for raspberries and one for blueberries? Certainly. Why wasn't I informed? You should hire manners, mistress. She would die of delight to serve a prince. I went on to describe all our mistresses. Writing mistress was the only one who taught anything worth knowing, I concluded. Although it is helpful to know the proper way to behave, so one can decide whether or not to be proper. On the word proper, Char started. I should have introduced you long ago to my knights. He called to them. Friends, John, Aubrey, Bertram, Percival, Martin, Stephen. Meet our ogre tamer. She's the lass I told you about, the one who speaks nomic. He had told them about me. I curtsied. We wondered when you would remember your manners, the one named Stephen said. Seif made a garbled noise through his gag. For a moment, I had forgotten him. Char went to the ogres, and I followed. So much as you are our friends, so much are we your friends, he said. But we won't kill you unless you force us to. For an instant, Seif looked dumbstruck. Then he began to struggle violently against his bonds. The other ogres did likewise, and shrieked through their gags as well. The ropes held, and they quieted slowly. Seif glared at me with such rage and hate that I fell back a step. I held his gaze, however. You are never going to eat me, I told him in ogres. I am not an it, and I'm not your dinner. And how do you like being tricked into doing what you don't want to do? Telling them felt wonderful. I smiled at Char. For some reason, he blushed. While Char and I addressed the ogres, the knights were busy setting out lunch for all of us. When we were seated, we delayed our first bite until Char began to eat. It was so natural to him, I doubted he noticed. Over traveler's bread, cheese, dried meats, sweet cider, he told me about his mission to help King Gerald. The king will be glad to see this lot. Eight ogres, and no injury to us. Sir Stephen nodded at the ogres, who were struggling anew at the sight of our meal. He'll be interested to learn that humans can use their magic against them, Char said. At least Ella can. Whenever he finds out, Sir Bertram frowned, how will we convey them to King Gerald? No need for your melancholy, Sir Bert, Sir John said. With this maid's help, we just caught eight ogres. Six knights never did that before. We'll think of something, Char said. They'll have to be fed, Sir Bertram reached for the bread. And you're the best hunter we have, Sir Bert, Char said and the knight's expression lightened. Ogres move quickly, Sir Martin said. It shouldn't take too long to reach the king. I've been told they can outrun a horse, Sir Stephen added. A centaur, too, even a hart. While Char and the knights discussed the ogre transport, I thought about the wedding and despaired of getting there in time. It was three days from now, and I was even farther from the giants than I had been when the ogres had captured me. If I walked, I would arrive weeks late. And then I remembered Nish's order not to run away. I could not leave anyway. Sir Bertram's gloomy voice penetrated my thoughts. 
We'll have to drag them. And how can we do that? The young lady can tell them to go wherever we say, Sir Aubrey said. She can come with us and keep them biddable. Let the prince tell us what to do, Sir Stephen said. He knows. Char spoke confidently. You, Stephen, will escort Lady Ella to her destination, wherever that is. Martin and Percival will ride to my father for assistance. Sir Bert, Aubrey, John, and I shall take turns hunting and guarding the ogres. We'll put the wax back in our ears when we are within earshot of them, in case their gags slip. I'd rather stay with you, lad, Sir Martin said. You and Percival are our best scouts. We'll depend on you to get through quickly, Sir Martin nodded. The maiden will be safe with me, Sir Stephen bowed. I'll... Unless he talks her to death, Sir Aubrey interrupted. You don't know him, lady. His speech stops only when the stars shine green in a yellow sky. He'll be a better companion than the ogres, Char said. But, Ella, why didn't you go back to Frell when you left finishing school? My father is trading at a giant's farm, where a wedding will take place soon. He wrote the giant's weddings are interesting. I thought I'd join him there. Char marveled. You put yourself in danger. In order to see a wedding? He thought me a fool. Sir Bertram spoke. It's fortunate that all the maidens in Kyria do not decide to travel by themselves. We have work enough without having to rescue them. If all the maids in Kyria could tame ogres, Char said, we would have much less to do. Perhaps not such a fool, after all. After lunch, Sir Stephen mounted his horse, and Char lifted me behind him. As soon as he did, my curse-caused complaints began. In a moment, I was going to fall off the horse. The curse wasn't going to let me abandon the ogres. I don't like to leave you in danger, I said, starting to dismount. Go with Sir Stephen, said Char. We won't come to harm. It was an order. I could go. My symptoms stopped. Char caught the horse's bridle. Will you soon be in Frel again? If father doesn't send me back to finishing school, and if he doesn't want me to travel with him. Why did he want to know? Did he want me to be? Why do you ask? He didn't answer directly. I should be back shortly. These maneuvers never last long. He spoke as though he'd been on thousands. Perhaps I'll see you then, and you can tell me about the ogres you catch. Perhaps you can teach me how to tame an ogre. Athun sing, I said. That's farewell. It sounds evil. It is, I answered, and we parted. Sir Stephen was indeed talkative. He had a small manor in Frau, a wife, four daughters, and two hounds. The hounds were the joy of his life. Smarter than pigs, cats and dragons all rolled together, he said. As we rode, he recounted tale after tale of their bravery and cleverness. When do you think we'll reach the giants? I asked when he stopped for breath. Three days, I should think. The day of the wedding. And we might arrive after it ended. Can we go any faster? I don't need much sleep. Maybe you don't, and I'm eager to get back to those ogres. But the horse needs his rest. We'll go as fast as he'll take us. I kicked the horse, hoping to spur him on and hoping Sir Stephen wouldn't notice. Sir Stephen didn't, and the horse didn't either. Sir Stephen began a tale about exhausted horses and a charge against dragons. When he finished, I hastily changed the subject. Do you like serving under the prince? Some might not fancy answering to a youngster, he said, but I am a toiling knight. What's that? Not so noble I can't curry my own horse, nor so greedy I have no time to serve my king. Is Char a toiling prince? That's a good description of him, little lady. I never saw a lad, page or prince, so eager to learn to do a thing right. According to Sir Stephen, Char was almost as wonderful as the hounds. He wasn't only eager to learn, he did learn, and quickly. He was kind. They had departed Frel late because of his kindness. The cart of a fruit and vegetable seller had overturned in the road ahead of them. When the seller began screeching that everyone would trample his precious tomatoes and melons and lettuces, Char had us right to the cart. Then he spent the better part of an hour on his hands and knees rescuing vegetables. As he rescued me, you're a long mile prettier than the grape or a squash, and you needed a long mile less rescuing. I never caught an ogre so neatly before. 
I turned the conversation away from me and back to Char. He's smart and he's steady, the prince is, Sir Stefan continued. Too steady, maybe. Too serious, maybe. He laughs when there's something to laugh at, but he doesn't play enough. He's been with the king's counselors too much. Sir Stefan was quiet for a rare moment. He laughed more this morning with you than in two weeks with us. He should frolic with the young folks more, but they're on their best behavior with the prince. He turned his head. Except for you, little lady. I was alarmed. Did I behave badly? You acted natural, not like a courtier. Manners, mistress, would consider me an utter failure. I smiled. We spent our nights at inns. The first night, I retired to my room soon after dinner. I set my Agulin wolf on the table next to my bed so he could protect my sleep. On the verso was a letter from Hattie to her mother. On the recto, one to the same lady from Olive. I read Hattie's first. Dear Mama, is not my penmanship much improved? I have been practicing my flourishes. The words may be harder to read, and writing mistress despairs of my spelling. But when you stand away from the page, is the result not charming? Sir Peter's daughter has vanished. Madam Edith says she was called away in the night. However, I suspect Madam Edith is lying, and that Ella has run off. There is always something devious and deceitful about her, although her father is such a charming, rich man. My new tresses are divine, and I emerged among the other girls again two days ago when they arrived. I suspect my locks may have vanished with Ella. A heartless prank to play on me, who always treated her with kindness. But I still hope she has come to no harm, and has not been eaten by ogres, or captured by bandits, or caught fire, or fallen into bad company, as I often imagine." The rest of the letter recounted the compliments Hattie had received on the new gown. She ended with a farewell and the largest flourish of all. The recto. Hattie. Dear Mother, I have been feeling poorly all week. I have headaches, especially when I read. You always say much reading is bad for the eyes, but writing mistress won't listen. She called me little more than an idiot and said there will be no hop for me when I am grown if I don't learn to read better. Hattie says Ella was bad to leave, but I think she was bad not to take me too. Ella did everything Hattie told her to. I wish people did what I want. It's not fair. Your miserable daughter, Olive. The whole page was full of blots and crossouts. Each letter was formed with a wobbly hand, as though the writer didn't know how to hold a pen. Poor Olive. Her letter was followed by a sad tale about the genie in Aladdin's lamp. He had been forced by Aladdin's false uncle, the magician, to take up residence in the lamp, and had been given power to grant everyone's wishes but his own. Before he was captured, he had been in love with a goose girl. The genie spent his years in the lamp longing for her and wondering whether she'd married someone else, whether she'd grown old, whether she'd died. I closed the book, weeping a little. I wasn't confined to a lamp, but I too was not free. The size of things began to grow shortly after we started out on the third morning. In the past, objects far away had always appeared smaller than objects close by, but now the old rule stood on its head. The trees near to us were dwarfed by the trees in the distance ahead. At ten o'clock, I saw a pumpkin as wide as I was tall. At eleven, we passed one as big as a carriage. At noon, we saw a giant. He was building a stone wall out of boulders. It was already twice my height, and I shuddered to think of the livestock it would pen. When the giant saw us, he trumpeted his pleasure. Uayagi! Honk! he called dropping a rock and thundering toward us, his mouth open wide and a huge smile of welcome. Our horse reared in fright, and I struggled to keep my seat till the giant reached down and touched the beast gently on his muzzle. He quieted instantly, and even nuzzled against the giant's thigh. Aopi! Ai u kobi! Screech! U babi ayu! I said. It meant hello in Abdigi. We've come to attend the wedding of Uaxi's daughter, I added in Kyrian. But are we too late? You're just in time. I'll lead you there. The farm was two hours away. 
Kubudak, the giant, strolled next to our horse. Is Uaxi expecting you? he asked. No, I answered. Will she mind? Mind? She won't be able to thank you enough for coming. Giants love strangers, he paused. And friends, too. Lots of friends and strangers will be there. We traveled in silence for a while, with Kapudak smiling down at us. Are you tired? Hungry? he asked presently. We're fine, Sir Stephen said, although I was starving. Everyone is polite, except giants. We say when we're hungry. Never mind. There's lots to eat at a giant's farm. Uaxi's house was visible an hour before we reached it. That's her house, Kapudak announced, pointing. It's nice, isn't it? Enormously nice, hugely nice, Sir Stephen said. Don't you think so, lass? I nodded. My heart began to pound so hard I thought it would catapult me backward off the horse. Soon, I might find Lucinda. Soon, I might be free. <laughs>